CBS Evening News with Dan Rather and Connie Chung. Good evening. There is a new price tag tonight on the alleged sellout of America. The U.S. government now says a top spy and his wife earned close to $3 million from the Kremlin with the promise of more to come. And what did the Russians get? Prosecutors today began laying out a trail of treason. CBS News national security correspondent David Martin has the story. Dressed in prison fatigues, Aldrich Ames and his wife sat without looking at each other as FBI agent Leslie Weiser revealed a litany of damaging evidence found in their home. A nine-page letter from Ames's Russian handlers listed the kinds of CIA secrets they wanted from him. Number one on the list, the identities of CIA agents inside Soviet intelligence. The same document also revealed Ames gave away the identity of one CIA agent codenamed Motorboat, who vanished and was never heard from again. The damage Ames was in a position to do went far beyond the identities of individual agents. His home computer contained more than 100 classified CIA cables, and his office at CIA headquarters contained one top secret document dealing with American efforts to track Russian submarines. Another document found in Ames's home was a balance sheet addressed dear friends from his Russian handlers. Dated May 1989, it said $2.7 million had been appropriated for Ames. Agent Weiser said the FBI has traced $2.5 million to bank accounts in Switzerland and the U.S. That, said Agent Weiser, is at least twice as much as the Russians had ever paid any other spy. A former KGB officer says Ames was clearly worth it. But the information received from uh, Mr. Ames was so valuable. It was so damaging to the American interest and to the, inter to the interest of the whole Western intelligence community. According to Weiser, Rosario Ames said her husband started receiving the money in 1985 and that six years later he told her he had been spying for the Russians. Her lawyer said those statements were made in a state of shock when she had just been arrested and separated from the couple's five-year-old son. But government attorneys showed little sympathy for Mrs. Ames. She's been riding the Russian gravy train, one of them told the judge. At the end of today's hearing, the judge ordered Ames and his wife held without bail while the case goes to a grand jury. David Martin, CBS News, Washington. Espionage charges carry a maximum penalty of life in prison. That is also the penalty career criminals could face under a proposal supported by President Clinton. It's called Three Strikes and You're Out. But as correspondent Bob Schieffer reports, opponents were swinging away at it today. At a congressional hearing, Rangel of New York called the idea an election year ploy. Concentrate on preventing crime, he said, not filling the jails with three-time losers. It's a knee-jerk political response to a very, very, very serious problem. Other critics said it just costs too much. Has to be, where will that money come from? Will we lay off police or teachers, reduce uh, the number of probation officers we have? But those weren't the concerns of the parents of crime victims questioned by committee chair Schumer. They were just fed up and scared. What I would ask is, would anybody in this room be willing to allow their children to go out into the streets of Washington after dark? I think not. That's the father of Polly Kloss, the young California girl kidnapped and killed last year by a man previously convicted of six crimes. And these are the Adamses of North Carolina, whose son was shot dead by a repeat offender two days before Christmas. And with all of our rights, the only right that my son Richard has is the right to remain forever silent. The president has already endorsed the concept of putting away three-time offenders for life. But to satisfy critics, including Attorney General Janet Reno, who feared such a law would soon overcrowd prisons with drug offenders, the White House said today it wants the law defined to cover only those convicted of serious, violent crime. And as it's now framed, key legislators say the bill has a good chance of becoming law later this year. But it'll be a tough fight all the way. Bob Schieffer, CBS News at the Capitol. In New York City tonight, police are investigating an unusual attack on a van full of Jewish students. It happened in full daylight, a drive-by shooting on the Brooklyn Bridge. Correspondent Jacqueline Adams reports. Tonight, much remains unknown, but this much is certain. In a bizarre and terrifying attack, four young members of the Orthodox Hasidic movement were shot too critically when a lone gunman in a passing car fired at least five shells into the van in which the students were traveling over New York's Brooklyn Bridge. 
One witness claimed the shooter shouted a racial slur in Arabic. And they hear uh, screaming, Adbah al Yaud, it's meaning kill the Jew. But New York City officials, afraid of sparking ethnic tensions, emphasized late today that they could not confirm that account or rule out that the shooting was merely a traffic accident gone horribly awry. We have not found any witness that tells us there was any conversation or any talk or shouting at all between the vehicle and the, the shooting vehicle and the van. No indication of that as to whether this individual that uh, was cut off in traffic and took offense, whether it was intended, an intended assault. Uh, we, as the mayor has already indicated, are not ruling anything out of this juncture. The shooting has raised fears because it came just five days after a Jewish extremist killed scores of Palestinian worshippers at a mosque on the West Bank. The gunman in that shooting, however, had no known links to this Hasidic sect based here in Brooklyn. Tonight, the wounded students' comrades held a prayer vigil outside their hospital, while police continued to search for the driver of a late model Chevrolet Caprice. Jacqueline Adams, CBS News, Brooklyn, New York. Halfway around the world on the West Bank today, Israeli soldiers shot and killed a Jewish settler. Not many details yet, but the army said the settler shot first. It's part of a wave of violence since dozens of Muslim worshippers were slaughtered by a Jewish gunmen on Friday. As Bob Simon reports, Israeli leaders are scrambling desperately to get the peace talks back on track. Free at last. More than 500 Palestinians were bused from Israeli jails to their riot-scarred towns and villages, which were under curfew. They gave back their last pieces of prison property and went home ahead of schedule. Today's release was a gesture designed by the Israelis to help regenerate the peace process after Friday's massacre. But no one was saying thank you. The release that happens today, the feelings, is, uh, was the, the price of, of our blood. In Tunis, Yasser Arafat dismissed the release as cosmetic, not enough to get him back to the tongs. In the occupied territories in Jerusalem, where clashes today seem to crop up out of nowhere, the peace process was not a Palestinian priority. People wanted other things first, like protection. We want to see some United Nation to protect us. We are armless. We have no arms to defend ourselves. The Israelis are convinced that ultimately Arafat has no choice, that he must return, that he will return to the peace talks. But even if they're right, there's another question lurking in the background. Who will he represent when he gets there? Palestinian streets are seething with anger, and it is directed as much at the PLO leader as at the Israelis. It is Arafat who took us down this road, people say, and it led to Hebron. In my opinion, it's time for somebody else to take on. I don't think about Arafat. I don't, I don't like to hear about Arafat. Disarming the settlers would help Arafat and the negotiations, but that's not in Israeli plans. In one area, though, there's room for gestures. There are more than 8,000 Palestinians left in Israeli jail. Bob Simon, CBS News, Jerusalem. Straight ahead on the CBS Evening News, it could be the answer to many a bedtime prayer a new treatment for insomnia. Plus, Eye on America. Tonight, the results of our investigation into the long life of just one handgun. The Environmental Protection Agency is finally out today with rules calling for drastic cuts in air pollution from chemical plants. The new regulations are two years overdue. And in most cases, the chemical plants will now have another three years to comply. Where have all the frogs gone? New research indicates more and more of them are vanishing in the ozone hole. The latest study finds that amphibians of all sorts, frogs, toads, and salamanders, are all in decline. Their eggs are very sensitive to radiation from the sun, and scientists say radiation levels are increasing because of continuing depletion of the planet's ozone layer. Attention insomniacs. This next story could help put you to sleep. New research indicates there may soon be an effective new sleeping pill with fewer harmful side effects. CBS News health correspondent Dr. Bob Arnott has the eye-opening story of a hormone called melatonin. More than 100 million Americans suffer from insomnia. Sleeping pills, while helpful in the short run, can cause addiction and hangovers. But now government researchers say there's a natural and inexpensive new remedy a dietary supplement called melatonin, widely available in health food stores. This is so great because it's the only 
compound that we know of that can uh, act specifically on the biological clock and it is essentially non-toxic. Melatonin can actually signal the brain to fall asleep. A new study at MIT shows that patients given small doses of melatonin fell asleep three times faster and stayed asleep about twice as long as those who took nothing at all. Which, which one is it? June DeSalvo was sleeping well for the first time in 25 years. She had tried every prescription drug in the book, even hypnosis. Nothing worked until melatonin. It's phenomenal. Melatonin gives me uh, the boost that you need to get to sleep then the quality of sleep is improved along with the fact that I feel restored. Melatonin is a natural hormone like estrogen or insulin, but unlike all other hormones, melatonin is not regulated as a drug by the FDA. And some doctors say, before you rush out to buy it, consider this. I don't think people should be allowed to go and just buy it off the shelf because like any other hormone, you can be sure it has other effects. And since melatonin is not regulated, consumers can't be certain of the potency or purity of the product they buy, which can vary from bottle to bottle. There are no known dangers to melatonin. Consumers just may not be getting all the melatonin they paid for. Dr. Bob Arnott, CBS News, New York. Well, the U.S. economy certainly appears to be wide awake. Official government figures indicate the economy was growing in the final quarter of last year at an annual rate of 7.5%. That is the strongest showing in nearly a decade. The good news did not go unpunished on Wall Street. Stock prices fell on fears that a fast-growing economy might ignite inflation. The United States and Russia each stepped up the pressure today, pushing for an agreement to end the war in Bosnia, in Washington. Bosnian Muslims and Croat leaders agreed on a U.S. brokered plan to form a kind of federation in the parts of Bosnia not already under Serb control. Meanwhile, Serbian forces have again yielded to pressure from Moscow, agreeing to ease their siege of a key Muslim town. Correspondent P Barry Peterson is on the scene in Bosnia. The push to open Tuzla's shell-damaged airport for a humanitarian airlift took a big step forward today. The Russians made it happen, pressuring the Bosnian Serb leader during meetings in Moscow. He agreed to pull his guns back if the Serbs' old allies, the Russians, police the peace in Tuzla. Nothing can be achieved without Russia in the Balkans. No way, said the Bosnians, still furious about the hero's welcome the Serbs gave Russian UN soldiers sent to Sarajevo. And saying the Serbs are only giving it on Tuzla because NATO finally pulled the trigger, shooting down four Serb jets. This, their technology is a Mickey Mouse for NATO. I mean, that's a difference in generation. And uh, uh, I mean, when NATO means business, you'll see progress in these areas. Progress today, relief convoys on the move again. The UN is going to take advantage of this tough new attitude on the part of the West pushing more convoys through Bosnia and not always taking no for an answer. But they had to take no when a convoy forging a new route to Sarajevo was blocked by Serb women. They accused the Bosnians of holding their children prisoner. No aid goes through, says this woman, until they're free. Still, the Serbs are making concessions. As soldiers gave the UN Special Envoy a lift, there was hope this new momentum for peace won't get bogged down in the quagmire that is Bosnia. Gary Peterson, CBS News, Sarajevo. Still ahead on tonight's CBS Evening News, meet a political lightning rod named Rodham. That's Hugh Rodham, the First Lady's brother. A showdown vote in the U.S. Senate tonight may be just for show. At stake, a constitutional amendment to require a balanced federal budget. But hours before the final vote, supporters of the amendment all but conceded defeat. President Clinton opposed the amendment, calling it unworkable and a threat to the economy. In Florida, a first-time-ever candidate for public office declared today for a U.S. Senate seat. And already, he is a focus of national attention because of his ties to the White House. Not just political ties, family ties. Correspondent Linda Douglas profiles the Rodham for Senate campaign. He is a public defender in Dade County, Florida, who spends his days trying to keep drug offenders out of jail. But Hugh Rodham's got bigger goals now. I'm throwing my hat in the ring. 
to become the next senator from the state of Florida. Thank you. Rodham has never run for public office, in fact, never even voted until his brother-in-law ran for president. Hugh is Hillary Rodham Clinton's brother, but insists he's not exploiting family connections. For the 1600th time, I shall answer the question again. I am doing this because I feel it's right to do. Rodham bristles at questions about his lack of political experience. I don't have any legislative experience, but then again, neither did George Washington, and Dwight D. Eisenhower didn't either. Rodham is trying to challenge the extremely popular Republican senator, Connie Mack. Though most of his positions are vague, he's for the Clinton health plan and gun control. He says the war in Bosnia isn't worth risking American lives. I think that every American life is something that we need to value over and above what petty concerns a civil war in Bosnia might have. Sources say the Clintons tried to discourage him from running. Republicans fume at what they say is the unchallenged power of the First Lady, and they've been waiting for the right opportunity to attack her. Now, Hugh Rodham's candidacy may finally have given them the chance they've been looking for. Well, you don't have to be very subtle about it, simply the name Rodham. We're delighted, uh, very candidly, that, uh, that Hugh Rodham has decided to get in the race. Rodham brushes aside critics who say he shouldn't try to enter politics at the top. I mean, I couldn't very well run for King of England. That job's already taken. Hillary Clinton's staff says she supports her brother, but she hasn't decided if she's going to campaign for him yet. Linda Douglas, CBS News, Miami. Coming up next, Eye on America. Tonight, a special CBS News investigation of handguns and their life after death. The Brady Law has been in effect a couple of days now, but no one expects it to put any big dent in handgun crime. For one thing, the law covers only guns bought from licensed dealers. And as you're about to see, there is no telling where a gun will wind up. Correspondent Jim Stewart has the results of a CBS News investigation in tonight's Eye on America. This Glock Model 17 9mm semi-automatic pistol was made eight years ago in Austria by Glock Firearms. It has killed twice that we know of. The last victim was Linda Cavazos' husband. What do you know about Glock? They're called uh, cop killers. Why? Because that's what they do. Five weeks before Trooper Jose Cavazos, the same gun killed Army Sergeant George Mallet. Because it killed two public servants, CBS News set out to track its life story. We'll just grab one box here. It led us through canyons of federal documents to grisly crime scenes, twisted pieces of evidence, and shattered lives. A frustrating journey into the little regulated world of American firearms. This Bedford, Texas storefront used to be home to Bel Air Sporting Goods, the gun's last known legal address. But no one, including police or the gun dealer, knows where it went after it left here. On a month, I'd say average uh, 45, 50 handguns a month. Mark Carl used to own Bel Air. The Glock was real popular because it was a new gun at the time. Customers especially like the Glock because it holds 17 bullets. Carl sold this one in late 1986. The law requires dealers to keep a log of everyone who buys a gun and ship it to the ATF when they go out of business. I shipped it through the mail. And best you remember to where? Dallas. The ATF office in Dallas. Have you been able to track any of that? No, we tried to find those records, and uh, we have no record of our office in Dallas ever receiving those records, and we know that the records are not here in the Out of Business Record Center. It happens all the time. Only one in four dealers ever sends in his records. Some get lost. I need some assistance with a gun trace, please. Once it leaves the dealer, tracing a gun in America, it turns out, is a bureaucratic nightmare. We have 200 people trying to keep up with 287,000 dealers. That means there are millions of guns here you know nothing about now. That's very possible. One of them was our Glock. Seven years after Texas, it surfaced last January in Fayetteville, North Carolina, on Sergeant David Bloomfield's beat. Uh, the shooting actually took place right here. Sergeant George Mallett was out looking for his lost dog. He began to ask these two people, have you seen my dog? 22-year-old Norman Howell didn't like the tone of the question. He fired seven times. Mallet, father of three, died at the scene. We knew what kind of gun it was. We just did not have that weapon. The gun had already begun another journey. Fayetteville drug dealer Lonnie Weeks said he was driving to Washington to sell it when Jose Cavasso stopped him for speeding. Weeks fired five times. He took my husband's life. 
in just seconds. Like it didn't even matter. Lonnie Weeks was sentenced to death, Norman Howell got life, and Glock serial number 8W954 finally ended up here. Its journey along the way, totally unrecorded. Once it leaves our hand, it's, it's out of control. It can end up in anybody's hands. Even a killer's. Even a killer's. We don't have the resources to go out and follow up on every single thing that's out there. And there is this irony. The car driven by Jose Cavazos' killer was traced to its original owner within minutes. The gun he killed with never was. In Manassas, Virginia, this is Jim Stewart for Eye on America. And that's part of our world tonight. Coming up tomorrow on CBS News, find out how spring flooding in the Midwest could hit you in your wallet. Join Harry Smith and Paula Zahn first thing tomorrow for CBS This Morning. And Dan and I will see you again tomorrow night. Thank you for joining us and for all of us at CBS News. Good night. Good night, everybody. Pour une première, c'est une réussite quand même. Je suis très fière de mes carottes. Hein eh Bah où elles sont, vous avez vu Elles sont parties. Les carottes Ouh, ouh les... Je vois des petits yeux. Quatre petits yeux. Les taupes. Ce sont les taupes qui sont de retour. On a encore des taupes à la maison, incroyable. Pff, quel souci, vraiment. Vraiment de quoi faire cauchemarder un chien, vous allez voir.